as part of, of the FinTech for You program that is um, designed and built to support uh, FinTech entrepreneurs that are going through the, the, through the program. Um, we're also supported by the Bank of Zambia, Securities and Exchange Commission, and and uh, the uh, Zambia Air Information and Communications and Technology Agency as the regulators in the fintech space who have gladly joined the program or supported the program to have direct contact and uh, with uh, the, those of you who are in the program. Today, we are host uh, Jimmy Kuvaras, who is Manager Payment Systems and Research, Payment Systems Research and Development at the Bank of Zambia, uh, who is going to give us, shed some light on what the regulatory framework is, that the regulatory landscape is with regards to um, financial technology uh, solutions that are being built for the local company. Uh, financial inclusion is a big conversation, but within that space also is solutions that work for B2B, for other businesses, or the financial uh, systems themselves, and how, uh, how those get regulated and how uh, consumers or clients get protected is something that I'm very, very certain that uh, the, regulator, the regulator is looking out for. So please uh, welcome uh, Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy, we will get into a conversation. Uh, have first of all, get into uh, your talk. I believe you're not making a presentation, but you will give us a talk on various points that we should look out for. And anybody who's got any questions, please feel free to put up your questions so that you don't forget them, so that we can share them with Jimmy uh, when the time comes for questions, or if he decides to ask for questions at any time during the program. Thank you, Jimmy. I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Smuza, and good morning, everyone. So, my talk with you basically focus on how the Bank of Zambia regulatory landscape currently is, and uh, with a special focus towards uh, financial technologies, fintechs. So, for Bank of, I'll focus on the payment systems aspect. Other aspects uh, that I've seen in the questions, such as uh, those dealing with loans or credit reporting and such things, there's a specific depart department within the bank that uh, handles that, and I'll be able to arrange for another person to handle that aspect. But for today, we'll focus on the payment systems aspect of financial technologies. So the act that gives us powers, the Bank of Zambia, to regulate payment systems is called the National Payment Systems Act, which was enacted in 2007. Um, under the National Payment Systems Act, we have various licenses. We have the Payment System Business License. We have the Payment Systems License as well as a payment system participant license. So just for clarity, a payment system business is any business that is involved in money transfer service or anything that the Bank of Zambia deems to be a payment system business. You will notice from the definition that the payment system business is sort of broad. This is because of the um, fast innovation of the changing nature of payment system businesses where one day you have a fintech providing this or another providing this so it was necessary to make it to make it generic so that uh, we are then able to determine uh, whatever changes and then we can uh, regulate that aspect as a payment system business a payment system basically this is sort of an infrastructure that is that is organized or rules that allow participants or um, financial service providers to be able to participate in a payment system so for example in zambia we have the zambia electronic clearing house limited and this is a, an entity that allows checks to clear or direct debits or direct credits to be able to make those transfers people to transfer and uh, the participants can offer this service to members of the general public. So a participant now is that entity now that participates in a payment system. So those are the three types of licenses that we have under the national. 
and for any person under the law, under the National Payment Systems Act, for any person to offer a payment system service, they are required to have a license duly issued by the Bank of Zambia. And that is why we require that before any fintech or anyone uh, offers their service to the public, they get licensed by the Bank of Zambia. So that handles the aspect of what type of licenses we have. Now, I noted a question from, from early on uh, regarding cryptocurrency. As the Bank of Zambia, we issued a press statement sometime, I think as early as 2017 or early 2018, regarding cryptocurrencies. And in that press statement, you will note that uh, the Bank of Zambia recognized that uh, cryptocurrencies have some monetary characteristics. But then under Section 30 of the Bank of Zambia Act, it is stated that only the Bank of Zambia is vested with the authority to issue legal tender. So as it stands right now, cryptocurrency is not legal tender on the basis that it is not issued by the Bank of Zambia. Only the Bank of Zambia can issue legal tender. Anything else that's not issued by the Bank of Zambia. However, the Bank of Zambia is innovative. They have said that we will continue to watch this space and then we will guide, we'll guide the public appropriately. There are risks that have been noted. I'm sure everybody knows these risks. There's money laundering that's, um, that can be associated with cryptocurrencies. So members of the public were warned to be very careful before engaging in anything that is uh, involving crypto cryptocurrencies just to note that from the licensing. So the Bank of Zambia has not licensed or given any license regarding cryptocurrencies. If there's any question regarding what I've said so far, uh, feel free to interject and then we can address that question or maybe the questions will be addressed at the end. Okay, I've been guided that the questions will be, will be addressed at the end. Well, now, we have identified three types of licenses that are issued under the National Payment Systems Act by the Bank of Zambia. So the next question is, what is required for a person or what are the requirements for a person that wishes to be licensed under any of these three types of licenses, whether it's a payment system, a payment system business, or a payment system participant? First of all, for you to get a license from the Bank of Zambia, you must be a body corporate. How do you prove that you're a body corporate? You have your certificate of incorporation and articles of association. That will tell us that no, this person is a, indeed a body corporate. So when you come to the Bank of Zambia, one of the requirements will say is give us a certified copy of your certificate of incorporation or articles of association. One of the usual things that we see is you see the requirement states that provide a certified certificate of incorporation, and then you see an applicant has not certified their certificate. So those are the small, small things that usually we advise uh, new applicants or fintech um, promoters to look out for. When you come to the bank as well, aside the certificate of incorporation, we'll ask you to tell us who are the key people involved in this business? So when we, we say who are the key people involved, we mean who are the managers, senior managers of this entity? Who are the directors of this entity? And who are the, the shareholders of this, of this entity? So for all those three categories of persons, we want to know, want to have a look at their CV. Are they qualified to run this business? Do they have the technical qualification? business and do they have the necessary experience to run that business that will apply to all of them whether it's shareholders directors or the managers why are we asking for this certain types of businesses require certain technical skills so we want to be sure are they qualified to run this business if they committed any crime elsewhere 
that will bring risk to this type of business. As a regulator, we want to protect members of the public. We want to protect the funds of the members of the public. So we want to be sure that any person that is entrusted with holding people's funds does have the required experience or character to be able. In short, that they are fit and proper to hold the office that they are being proposed for. So those are the checks that we do for individuals who will be running the firm. When you bring an application to the Bank of Zambia, another thing that to ask you to do is describe to us in detail what your services will offer. So let us say, for example, you're saying, no, we're coming to we want to provide this service, we want to issue electronic money so that people can pay bills, they can do P2P transfers with their peers, or they can handle any payment or just keep some money in their wallet for to pay a merchant or any sort of any other that any other service that can be supported by electronic money now when you come to us we want you to state to the bank in detail what sort of services you'll be offering to members of the public that will give us assurance that you know the sort of business you are entering into you you understand the business fully, and if there's any risks, if you understand, then you're able to get against any risks that any risk that may be introduced by your business. Further, we are a regulator. A regulator, in many cases, will always play a catch-up role. You are uh, many are the new businesses, are the innovators. They know the business they'll be running into. They know the services that they'll be offering. So we want confidence to see that this person really understands the business that they are entering into. And that's why we ask, describe to us what sort of services you'll be offering. And then we can be able to guide fully to say, okay, indeed, this person understands what they're getting themselves into and they understand the industry that they are entering including the regulatory landscape of that industry. Another thing that to ask for, one of the key requirements for, and these requirements and I'm giving, apply are the generic ones that to apply to all the three types of licenses under the National Payment Systems Act. We we'll ask you to give us a business plan. If, you, if it's already an existing firm, who ask for your previous financial statements for the two previous years. If it is a new entity, then we'll ask for a business plan that will give us your financial projections for the next two years. In any business, if your finances are not right, you're likely to go bankrupt. So we want to see based on your projections and your, the description that you've given us and the business plan, do your finances make sense? Are you likely to survive? If you introduce to the market this year, and then will you will you be able to be sustainable for the foreseeable future? I, do your figures make sense? So these are the things that we are asking for in your business plan. When you look at your when we look at your business plan and we look at the environment as it exists, where are you fitting? Where do you see the niche? What sort of need? What sort of problem are you addressing? In the, current, uh, in the current market? Are you simply copying what others are doing? Or are, you, are you targeting a particular niche in this market? So those are the things that we're looking for in your business plan. Another thing we ask for is the source and evidence of your capital. There are certain businesses where you'll be receiving, where you're receiving funds. For example, electronic money. You are receiving people's money and uh, by essence, we want to see that you have the necessary capital to be able to support that business. For business like e-money, they certainly, um, right now the bank has not prescribed minimum capital requirements when you're starting up, but once you are in operation, there's a certain capital which is given by a formula that you must hold once you start receiving uh, 
funds as an electronic money issuer. And capital also, it plays as a buffer. Should you run into any problem, which is normal for a new startup, do you have the necessary capital to be able to support or to be able to sustain your business while you are still finding your feet? Another thing that we look for also that to ask you is your governance arrangements. What sort of internal control mechanism do you have in your businesses? Is it the same person that's running finance, that's doing compliance? Do you have anti-money laundering mechanisms in place to address those risks that may be presented by a, where a customer of your service may abuse your system and undertake anti-money laundering activities? What are your accounting policies? What are your control mechanisms? Do you have segregation of duties in place? Have you identified various risks and have you put in place measures to address those risks? Among the key risks that you always look for, you are in finance here, is liquidity risk. It's financial technology, so you're providing a financial service to various members of the public. In some cases, you may use agents to provide these services. Do your agents have enough cash to be able to provide services on time to members of the public? You will not, in some cases, complaints where people come to the bank and say, uh, I went to, I had to go around a number of agents to be able to withdraw cash. So before you start your business, you want to see that you have identified such risks and you've put in place measures to make sure that when a person goes to this, uh, to this, ag to this, any of your agents, they'll be able to be and cash or liquidity or float will be available and they will not be inconvenienced. Other things that we ask for, in any, in, when you're providing a service as an, um, either as a payment system or a payment system business, usually it involves that you enter into agreements with other parties, whether they are providing you with a system or whether it's, uh, it's an arrangement for you to be able to more in loans using a licensed credit provider. We ask that you provide us with those agreements between yourself and other material parties that you entered into agreements to be able to provide that service. Why do we ask for such things? First, we want to ensure that any agreement that you've entered into with any other party is in line with the regulations as provided or regulatory landscape within, within the country. Uh, in some cases, either due to lack of knowledge or maybe somebody just doesn't, uh, doesn't want to comply with, with the laws, you find that you enter into an agreement that is not in line with the with regulations as provided by whichever regulator you are dealing with. So that's why we want to look at those uh, uh, contracts that you want to enter into and then we'll guide whether all the provisions that are given under those contracts are indeed in line with, with the regulations as they stand. And that also protects both parties. There may be um, provisions that are not that are not fair on one party or favor just one party, then we'll query those and ask if this is so, if this is a person taking the risk, why is this in this way? And that will benefit both parties or identify certain risks that you may not have seen, but now that they've been highlighted to you, you are then able to put appropriate measures in place to ensure that both parties are covered and the, tra the transactional contract is beneficial to, to everyone. I think regarding the re requirements, I'll end there. I'll just add one more. Um, um, I've spoken to agreements regarding any parties or any other external company that you need for you to be able to provide the service and the associated agreements that may be entered. Other key 
agreements that are usually in place. These will involve agreements like the holding account agreements for human issuers and the agency agreements when you are using agents to provide your services. Those are some of the general requirements that you will find across all types of um, licenses. There may be other more specific requirements that will apply to a particular license type. For example, a license for a payment system will require that the payment system operator has payment system by all the parties in that payment system. So those are the small changes that will um, that will apply for this for a payment system license and may not apply for a payment system business license. But those are quite small. Generically, what what I've laid out will apply towards all types of licenses. Okay, with, after that session, we'll then move on. We had, a, um, we noticed a query where we said, which licenses applies to the FinTech space? So FinTech financial technology, by nature, it has come up, it will apply to many others, not necessarily just the National Payment Systems Act, but you find fintechs that will be that will say they've come, they are offering crowdfunding, and then they are raising, sort of providing loans, but which are from various sources. So those lean towards uh, the Banking and Financial Services Act credit provision. So those may not necessarily be directly to payment systems. So to categorically state that um, there's a license that applies to fintechs would, um, would be flawed in some aspects. Fintechs, uh, it just depends where the problem is. I think they will arise where they see the opportunity. But you will not, many of the fintechs are, are come, have come up in the payment systems space and so they will, many of them will sort of fall under the National Payment Systems Act, but you notice fintechs that come to offer solar in energy, in the health, so it's, it's, not, it's not just, it's not exclusive just to the payment system sector, but for, for, for anyone. And we noted a question also from the, from the engagement earlier, for a company like EduPay, those uh, I remember interaction, I think I'll just is the company that was giving loans for education, right? Yeah, I think I remember engagement with EduPay earlier on. So for a company like EduPay from, uh, from the engagement that we had last time, these are basically giving loans for educational purposes. For, for that sector, since you are giving loans, uh, it would for it, it would be a service that would for the financial services act and we can give you contacts for the right people that uh, that will be able to guide what what sort of requirements you need to provide uh, to be able to give out loans and then there was a follow up to that stating that um, if you are um, if you are registered as a money lender, how do you, is there any limit when you need to guide, when you need to move towards uh, licensing under the, um, under, under Bank of Zambia? So the way it is operated, usually money lender is sort of like entry level. Many people opt to, a number of people have started out as money lenders and then graduated to licensing under under Bank of Zambia license. So money lenders money lenders license is issued by a separate by separate by separate authority and not and not the Bank of Zambia. But there's certain services where people run into challenges. Let's um, 
they give out loans. It's uh, just. Okay. So there's certain instances where people give out loans and they require a certain services, a certain service. For example, if they give loan but they want this to be the collections to be made through a bank. There are advantages that accrue by having a, a Bank of Zambia license. It just uh, it it carries that authority to say that you are overseen by a competent regulator, and so any um, any party, any any other external party that you wish to engage for a certain extra service, let's say to be able to undertake collections using a commercial bank, it just carries that authority to say that you are indeed uh, overseen by a competent operator, uh, or regulator, and you can be trusted to offer that service. So those are the uh, those are the advantages that accrue with getting uh, with upgrading the license to to operate and. Uh, under a Bank of Zambia issued license. Regarding the, um, the current, um, the review of the National Payment Systems Act, you, I stated that the National Payment Systems Act was enacted in 2007. So a number of developments of card, electronic money has come in place. A lot of things have changed. So when you compare, this is 2020, the act uh, was enacted, that act was in 2007. So there was need, um, there's need, there was need for the Bank of Zambia to have a look at this act and update it in line with developments. Second, the Bank of Zambia is a member to SADC, and uh, SADC issued a model law for all SADC member countries to be able to, to look at and adapt uh, necessary provisions or guidance issued under that law. So as Bank of Zambia, we've been reviewing the National Payment Systems Act. There's a bill that is in place that is undergoing review processes within the Bank of Zambia. And the many things, um, the many things under the new act that are being proposed, the act is more comprehensive to deal with a range of issues from consumer protection to issues such as uh, one with that would affect Bongo High would issues like regulatory sandbox approvals that can be given for new innovative products to be approved without undergoing through the, the rigorous licensing that I was just speaking to. So such, such changes that are being made to this act is in recognition of space such as we are discussing today, FinTech, you find um, a, a new company that may not have the either the financial mass or the the experience to meet the requirements that are put in the act, but has a really innovative product that would benefit the market. Then the act has provided there's a section in the bill that has provided for though for an approval to be given to such entity within within the framework that would be issued by the bank for those to be allowed to offer those services without the need to for a full for a full license another thing that is being proposed in the in the bill is consumer protection at a, at a time in 2007 the bill did not have rigorous provision of consumer protection, those are being brought up, those, are, those have been included under the new act. And also a sort of aligning of the licensing framework uh, regarding designation and licensing requirements. And also when a person or a licensed entity has one sort of license, but then wishes to offer another service that uh, uh, is requires a separate license. Do they need to go through? So just making things easy for people to 
add on additional services without the rigorous licensing that would be required under the under the current act i've noticed the question regarding micro class microfinance classification and provision in directives uh, i would recommend that this question will be answered under a person from the banking from banks provision and uh, non banks under the ba it's concerning banking and financial services act There was a question, what framework exists to, to guide fintechs? I, I think the fintechs that are operating, that are giving loans, with, that wish to engage in giving, to give loans in conjunction with a licensed microcredit provider. So when we give a license to a business, they will um, in detail explain to us what sort of services they'll be able to offer or they want to offer but like any business in the future they may wish to offer an additional service on top of what they were licensed to offer when they when they are making a product application when any business is making a product application let's say for example there's a business that's issuing e-money services but then they want to be able to offer micro loans in conjunction with a licensed credit provider. It is worth pointing out here, under the law, an e-money issuer is not licensed as a micro credit provider. So they are not allowed to issue loans in their own right. However, they can engage a, a licensed microcredit provider and loans can be issued through them but not by so for any additional service that they were not they were previously not authorized to give but they want to add on that service a licensed entity will then make an application to the bank and these usually come in the form of a letter with uh, some attachments to it. So what should be contained in that application? It to be a detailed description of what service is to. And if that service involves engaging another external person, will require that there be a written agreement between the two parties that will be reviewed by the bank. Another thing that should be accompanied in that application is a risk management framework relating to that service. The risk management framework, what are we looking for? What's telling the applicant? In this service that you want to offer, what risks have you identified? And how are you going to manage those risks? So three things so far that I've mentioned, a detailed description of the service that they want to offer, the associated agreement between the two parties if that involves an external party and the risk management framework regarding to relating to that additional service that uh, that applicant wants to offer to members of the public A contact person regarding uh, lending and uh, and payments. So the contact the contact person will be the director of banking, currency, and payment systems. All applications made for such additional services are made to the office of the director, banking, currency, and payment systems. When making a license, any license application by an applicant, those licenses are made to the Deputy Governor Operations, Bank of Zambia. But uh, before, our advice is that before you submit any application, especially the application for a license, that you engage the bank, officers are available that will guide you in terms of um, 
what you need to submit. And then when you are ready and the, the officers have, have guided you appropriately, then you can submit that application to, to the deputy governor operations. That avoids back and forth because then you have this engagement where we tell you that no, there's a deficiency here. I think you need to beef up your to beef up your application. But by the time you make, because product applications can only be made by licensed entity. So by the time, since it's a licensed entity, by then they're already aware of what, which offices where to seek this information. But for new applicants, it's always best that they engage the department and uh, they get the appropriate advice. I think from, from the regulatory navigation questionnaire that I received, those are the sort of issues that uh, I was guided needed some highlighting, but we can now enter into any specific questions that are there for, for me to be able to address. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kuvaras. Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat box so that uh, we can uh, line them up for you. Uh, a question from Benjamin Chilufia was, um, he believes the information you shared is very important. Is the information available, the information you've shared today available on the Bank of Zambia website? Yes, all the information that I've shared today is available on the Bank of Zambia website. What somebody can do is log on to the Bank of Zambia website, www.boz.zm. Go to a section called Payment Systems. If you want information regarding regulatory framework, this will give you information in terms of what regulations govern payment systems, what the requirements are for for you to get a license for a payment system business or a payment system itself, those will be under regulatory framework. If you want to see what entities are licensed by the bank, that information is there. So www.boz.zm, you click on payment systems, there will be regulatory framework, there will also be list of designated entities, and other information in terms of statistics that you get, how many, how much transactions, how much, international remittances, how much local money transfers, are all those statistics are there on the website. I thank you. That's, that sounds like a, a treasure trove of, uh, of information. Yes, um, Sam Sariri would like to know, um, could you kindly give us an example? You mentioned three types of payment licenses. Uh, could you kindly give us an example of companies under each uh, payment license? Okay, so... There are three types of licenses. I say the payment system business, a payment system, and a payment system participant. So a payment system business under the current National Payment Systems Act, like I said earlier, just good to for reminding, I said is any is any person offering a money transfer service or anything that the Bank of Zambia determines to be a payment system business. So a money transfer license. Let's say someone does, uh, we are in Zambia, this money transfer service, you want to send money to someone in, uh, in a condo. You go to an agent and, uh, or you go to Zampost, the swift cash money transfer, or you go to a Western Union money agent, you send money abroad to somebody in America, that is a payment system business. So money transfer, any movement of funds from one party to another, that is a payment system business. A payment system, uh, you, a number of you are aware of checks or direct debits or direct credits. A payment system usually involves infrastructure in the background. Usually people would not actually know what a pay, who, who, who a payment system uh, a payment system operator is because many people deal front end there. You are dealing with commercial banks. You are dealing with a financial service provider, a credit provider. But in the background, 
there's an operator who is enabling that payment system to operate. When you issue a check to someone, that person goes to their bank to cash out their check. But in the background, there's a company called Zambia Electronic Clearing House Limited that is doing all the aggregation to see which checks have been issued to process those checks and ensure that settlement occurs between all the banks that issue those checks. So that company that is in the background that has rules in place and arrangements to ensure that those payment instruments settle effectively, that is a payment system. They operate that payment system. So for um, I, I fear that your mic has gone mute. Uh, John, could you kindly look at your laptop? Your, the mic has gone mute. Okay. Thank you. Were you tracking me? Would you know where, where at which point? Uh, you were giving the example of, you were finalizing the example around uh, payment systems, uh, the payment systems license and companies that work in the background. Okay, okay. So I, I chose to use the example of a check. So when you issue a check to a person, the person will go to a commercial bank and deposit their check in that account or cash out that check from that commercial bank. But in the background, there is a company that is ensuring that that payment instrument, which is being issued and received by various banks, operates in a certain way and settlement occurs so that all those uh, participants who are, who are issuing and accepting that instrument are settled at agreed times. So that company that is in the background and aggregating those services is what you call a payment system. If you look at, um, let's give the example of Visa. If, if you travel to, if you travel to South Africa, you carry your card. You are able to draw money on a South African bank, even though your card is issued by a Zambian bank. You are a customer, your concern, your chief concern is just to get financial, to get access to your money. You, you are in South Africa, your bank is in Zambia. So in the background, there's Visa, who then aggregates to see, okay, this customer with a bank in Zambia went to draw money in South Africa. But, and then they, they, they the banks between, which are involved there who settle. Visa does the mathematics behind that. So that is an, another example of a payment system. On a local level, you, we now have the national financial switch of functional, which is being managed by uh, Zambia Electronic Clearing House Limited. You, if you are a Zanaco customer, you go on an APSA ATM, you are serviced. But in the background, the two banks must, must settle between each other. So there's a company in the background that does the aggregation and determines who, who should pay who and the nets between the various banks. That company that is doing that, that is a that is a payment system operated by someone. In this case, the operator is the Zambia Electronic Clearing House Limited. You will note that since this, on an aggregate level, this could involve huge, huge funds. So there's need for rules to be in place. What time will settlement occur? When a participant does not pay, what are the implications? So such rules are associated with a payment system. A key feature you will note that a payment system, rarely do people know that there's a payment system in place. It's usually in the background. A payment system participant 
those companies now that are participating, those financial service providers that are participating in that payment system. So in this case, from national financial switch example, it will be the commercial banks, those that will be the payment system participants in that payment system. I hope those are clear. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kovaras. Um, Sam um, Sariri and Jake Sinkata would like to get an idea of when uh, the sandbox will, a sandbox will come into play. Okay. Those, um, that provision is under the current, uh, is under the bill that is being reviewed. So as soon as that bill goes through parliament and is enacted into law, then that should, that will be in play. But already under the, um, under the current Bank of Zambia strategic plan, which commenced this year and will run to 2023, uh, that is being envisaged that by the end of uh, by the end of that of this current year, we should have a framework in place for how innovations will be approved by the Bank of Zambia. So this is to support innovation and also to promote financial inclusion. Our objective is not to constrain innovation with regulations, but to enable innovations to, to occur. And that is why that provision was put into the bill. So once the act comes in place, then that will be law. That, that, will, be, that will be enabled. But currently, even without that, what we do for current for applicants where it's a new innovation and we see there's a potential potential benefit in this innovation we do allow piloting where an entity is told okay um we've noted the innovation you made you may not have made all the requirements but to allow you a six month period to pilot your product and then if you meet given a certain set of within certain conditions if you meet these conditions the bank will review the license application and may give a license once all those conditions have been met by that applicant great thank you uh, melanie, melanie wilkinson would like to know what is the bank seeing with respect to pace of emerging fintechs uh, is uh, are we getting is it fast or is it slow are we responding towards the market um, and how does the bank see its role in, in, in measuring the impact of fintechs on the market um, and do you do you seem to see it a, a common trend of ideas that keep coming through to ask for licenses the pace of uh, the interest in, in fintechs and the pace of applications for license have been quite uh, quite enormous we have received various number of uh, license applications and uh, even on our end that was part of the push to have this uh, bill that will allow for certain innovations to be approved without need for one arrest license type so there's there's been a great number of there's been an enormous number of In, in, in the payment system space, uh, more specifically fintech. Does that remind me the last aspect of the question? Uh, I think I was asking around, uh, so there was the question around how does the bank uh, see its role in measuring the impact? But I, I added to that, uh, what, are the, what are the current trends from applications that are coming through? Now, many of the applications that we're seeing are in the sort of payment systems, uh, in the fintech space, payment system, money transfer, payment system, uh, micro microcredit with uh, a lot of partnerships with already existing uh, traditional financial service providers. So it's uh, it's it, it's it's growing, but our our appeal has always been that. Uh, not copy and paste, try to um, what can, what, what would succeed in Kenya will not necessarily succeed in Zambia. So um, I'll appeal to applicants to identify problems that are 
unique to Zambia and try to devise uh, or develop uh, products that will address those specific local local needs and not necessarily necessarily a copy and approach. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question. I know that you already addressed this, but maybe just uh, uh, in, in, in point for maybe somebody would like to ask again the question is, what is the bank's position with regards to cryptocurrency in Zambia? Okay, okay. so I'll just emphasize, there was a press statement that was given by the bank on cryptocurrency. The cryptocurrency was a monetary uh, characteristics in terms that they've been used to to pay for transactions or such. However, in Zambia, in line with Section 30 of the Bank of Zambia Act, only the Bank of Zambia can issue legal tender. Implication is that since crypt no cryptocurrency has been issued by the bank, it is not legal tender in Zambia. And in, in the press statement, the bank went on further to state there are certain risks that are associated with cryptocurrencies, such as money laundering, financing of terrorism, and indeed fraud. You will note that in, not, in the not so recent past, you will note from, if you look at the courts, in the courts of law within Zambia, you will note some people that were um, obtaining money by false pre Frequency or or whatever using cryptocurrencies uh, as a sort of as a disguise for what for the for the wrong things that they were doing. So members of the public were warned to be very careful and sort of ask the if it's too good to be true, then just ask the most obvious questions so that people are not uh, are not duped of their hand in money. So. There are some risks associated with cryptocurrencies. And uh, cryptocurrency is not legal tender in Zambia. The Bank of Zambia has not issued any cryptocurrency. And in the final way, in the final line in that press statement, the bank went on to say that the Bank of Zambia encourages innovation and it will continue to monitor this space to ensure that if there are any advantages that can accrue from it, they will they will, they will, they will remain open and just monitor the developments, not, not block anything per se. Thank you. Uh, in, in the same light, uh, Chisangam Kasanga asks that the Bank of England <coughs> plans to implement a central bank digital currency, CBDC. The benefits of this uh, support innovation and integration, improve usability of central bank money, uh, quicker settlements, and moving towards a digital future. Does the Bank of Zambia have plans towards moving towards a central bank digital currency? It, it's something that the Bank the bank of Zambia has, a, has a sub established a fintech unit. And one of the mandates of that unit is to, co to continually monitor developments in this space and uh, provide any recommendations. But at the moment, it's not something that they've that uh, that has been issued, but the bank will continue to monitor any developments in that in that space. Thank you, uh, Aurelio Francisco Diasis would like to know uh, what regulatory technology does the Bank of Zambia use for the regulatory process for their regulatory processes. So I guess this is now into the area of reg reg tech. Yeah, the bank has. Uh, is in the process of, uh, we have a project, a data automation project where we are, for all our regulated entities in terms of their submission of uh, retains and information for regulatory oversight. So it developed this uh, with support of our current partner uh, for, this pro for this program, uh, regulatory navigation, uh, UNCDF. So, that project essentially is to ensure that we get up to date information in terms of regulatory oversight and returns from our regulated entities that we have current information with which we can use now to devise 
up-to-date policies. So we do have a system that helps us to oversee our, our regulated entities. That is just for payment systems. There are other rate takes that are being done by other departments within within the bank. But the one I've, the example I've given is just for for the payment systems space. All right. Um, Chipulu Lubumbe would like to know, uh, in light of COVID-19 and the current situation, uh, would there be an expedited process for fintechs uh, with regards to registration uh, to ease modes of payment and encourage more innovation in the space? Uh, this, at this time, no statement of that nature has been issued. But if you, regarding COVID-19, if you looked at the, at the press statements that were given so far by Ministry of Finance, uh, you will note that the Bank of Zambia increased its limits for mobile money to encourage the use of mobile money, increased its limits for individuals, for the various tiers, agents, removed limits for corporates, as well as uh, agents. And this is all in line to ensure that people are encouraged to move away from cash and use more digital financial services because of the benefits that uh, accrue from the use of these uh, digital financial services. All right. um, Jack Mahindra would like to know, how will the NFS affect point of sale systems? What's the relationship, what will the relationship be between the two infrastructures? So if you see the National Financial Switch is a project that uh, will, will connect the ATM, the point of sale, as well as mobile payments. So it's been done in, it's been done in phases. In phases, the first phase was ATM and POS. Uh, that is nearing completion. The ATM is live, the POS is live. Uh, and now it's the mobile payments phase. So the implication is that previously, if I go to, um, if you are a customer with Bank X and you go on a point of sale that is acquired by Bank Y, that transaction was being routed internationally and then the money would be received since the processing was not being the processing was not being done locally. The challenge here is that now that process will be done locally through the national financial switch. No need to use an international firm for all local transactions. The issue of a transaction is in Zambia, and the acquirer of that transaction is within Zambia. So now those transactions will be process through national financial switch, which is operated by our Zambia Electronic Clearing House Limited. What the national financial switch has done is now, it's created an interoperable platform that has connected all these ATMs and point of sale machines. No need for these transactions to go, to be processed outside, outside the country. Since the issuer and acquirer of those transactions are yeah, oh, great. Uh, Chisanga Mkasanga would like to know um, what is Boza's uh, view on cloud based storage when it comes to registration of fintechs? So, fintechs may decide to use cloud based storages like uh, um, Amazon Web Services, Azure, and other places to store their data. Are there any security concerns of solutions being fully hosted in the cloud as opposed to physical storage and on premises? There's, um, our, our proposal would be asked possibly in the, in the next se session for, for a person from bank supervision as well as possibly our ICT department. And then there was also, I would route it towards, uh, as well as, uh, as well as Zikta. But we have, as a bank, we have, I've noted there are some there are a number of cloud-based solutions that, uh, that that have been approved and the economies of scale that arise from these uh, from these services because now you sort of this is a shared resource now that that 
that's benefiting a number of a number of organizations. However, ch uh, chief concerns regarding security those uh, those have to be put in place, and uh, the necessary officers obviously have to check that uh, the necessary necessary safeguards are in place. But uh, I would propose that probably we keep that question, and it would be asked to the um, to to our ICT as well as the other departments for that. And I would also propose that question for our ICT regulator. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kuvaras. Uh, we've come to the end of the questions that have been uh, shared with us. Uh, hold on, give me a second. Uh, sorry, I have one question. With reference to the NFS, you mentioned phases of implementation with financial institution. Is there room for third party solution mm -hmm. providers to provide solutions with direct integration to the NFS? Um, if they're coming, first of all, the, to connect to the NFS, they would need to be licensed. Uh, they would need to be licensed by the bank. What actually happens is, uh, if you're a financial service provider, you're issued with a license. You would go. The operator of the NFS is a Zambia Electronic Clearinghouse Limited. So, for anybody that wants to connect or take advantage of the interoperability that would be created by the national financial switch they would approach they would have to approach the zambia electronic clearinghouse limited at the commissa building and then uh, they, they they will be guided from there but a number of private this is remember the last phase i mentioned is mobile payments which is fintech fintech space so that's a phase dedicated to to the to the fintech uh, to the fintech space per se, so they they are at liberty to provide to engage to engage Zambia Electronic Clearinghouse Limited, and then they will be guided. If they one of the key requirements that I know Zeki asks for is that they, they they are licensed by the bank, and uh, I'm sure Zeki will guide them where they are not licensed, whether. Because if a third party provider is not licensed, then maybe they're operating through, they're offering their services to a licensed entity, then they'll be guided on how, how any, how the, what entry requirements exi uh, exist and uh, how, how they can achieve their end. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Kovaras. I think we've just come upon, I've uh, just gone past 11 o'clock, which uh, winds up the hour of, for the session that we had with you. would like to thank you very much for taking your time and also going, uh, giving us a very detailed look at um, licensing in the area of uh, payments. We are certainly looking forward to uh, the next session with the, the bank of, with the central bank, the Bank of Zambia, which will look at bank supervision and non-banking platforms. So any fintechs or any platforms that are looking to look at licensing in there would be very, very good. We appreciate that the time that you've taken to join us um, uh, under your department, which is payment systems research and development, and appreciate all the advice and all the questions that you have answered for us. Uh, thank you very much as well. Uh, this also gave us a chance to explain the regulatory requirements. However, if there are any other questions, we are still open. I'll leave my cards with uh, John here and then uh, either myself or my colleagues in the office, Jack Domingo or my boss, Mrs. Kamoza. Any other questions can be answered by those, by those individuals. Uh, thank you very much. We will share your contact details with the fintechs that are in the program so that they can, uh, if they do have any follow-up questions, they can definitely seek guidance with you. And we will follow on uh, with regards to a session with uh, the, the the team from banking and non-banking. Banking supervision and non-banking. All right. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Goodbye, everybody. See you. And we'll let you know when another session with the central bank is organized. Thank you.